house needs paint, grass needs mowing. Where's he at? Hi, this is Hank. Sorry I missed your call. Leave me your name and your number and I'll get back to you. He's gone fishing. Hello and welcome to Hank Parker Off the Water. Off the Water with Hank Parker. I got it wrong again. One of these days I'll get it right. My granddaughter and my co-host Sarah Beth over here keeping me straight or trying to. Trying to. Trying to. I like it. Hey, we got a fantastic show coming up today. I, I'm excited about this. Uh, information overload. How in the world do you process all the things that are taking place in the world of bass fishing or fishing in general? So uh, there's a lot of information, there's a lot of misinformation, and there's a lot of speculation that's being noted as fact. So uh, we're going to walk through that some today. Sarah Beth and I have been watching some videos, we've been watching some YouTube clips, and we've been watching uh, and reading about all these uh, uh, fiction facts, I guess would be a good way to determine uh, or to, uh, what would we say? Not determine, but be a good way to uh, put it into words, you know? To Terminology, summarize. a good way to put it into perspective is just a lot of people have an opinion. We all have them. And uh, there are three kind of people in the world. There's people that know, people that don't know, and then there's people that don't know they don't know. That's the ones you got to watch out for. The ones that don't know, they don't know. So, hey, I'm... Uh, I'm big on uh, going to high schools and meeting with, uh, with young anglers that uh, are wanting to learn more about the sport. And there is a tremendous amount of information available to kids today through the web and uh, on their handheld devices. And there's just so much out there uh, that I didn't have to face when I was a kid. We were starved for information, and kids today have way more information than they can possibly digest, you know? It's kind of like an all-you-can-eat buffet. You get all this stuff you like, and then when you get your plate down, you realize no way you can eat it all. And that's kind of the way these kids are. Uh, they, they've got so much information, they can't digest it. Yeah, that's when they say your stomach is bigger than your eyes. <laughs> Your eyes are bigger than your stomach. Uh, now, off yeah. the water with Hank Parker, I got <laughs> you back. Yeah, you got yes, me sir. Back. <laughs> My turn. So, yes, that's right. Your eyes are bigger than your stomach. You get all this stuff on the buffet, and then you realize you can't eat it. And if you did eat it, you couldn't digest it. It's going to make you sick. Mm -hmm. So, we got too much information out there that uh, is not, uh, it's fiction, opinion or speculation and not fact, but it's being taken a lot of times as fact. So here's where I come from. I think it's really, really important that you hook on to a Kevin Van Dam or a Bill Dance or someone uh, that is a high profile fishing personality that you trust to be honest with you, not sell you something just for the sake of making a nickel, uh, but be honest and you kind of, latch on to that person if you fish their their method or their style and and you kind of believe in them because there's too much speculation out there and it's too much information to be able to keep up with it all and it, it'll just overwhelm you. I'll be honest there are a lot of times I'm overwhelmed when you talk about drift everybody said well you need this minnow and you need this weight and you need to let it drift to the fish and well wait a minute now let me let me pick up on where you're coming from because I don't completely understand what you're talking about when you was drift. Uh, two years ago at the Bassmaster Classic in Knoxville Tennessee they were talking about uh, dragging the bottom and getting the fish to show themselves because they couldn't see them on their mega live and so they would use a technique to just drag the bottom where they didn't see a fish to get him to show himself and then they would mark him and go back and catch him. So all that is, is kind of foreign to me. So in order for me to understand, uh, you need to be really, really plain and explain to me exactly how you go about dragging the bottom where you don't see a fish on Mega Live and make him show himself and then you can figure out how to catch him. That, that's way more sophisticated 
uh, than, than I'm ready for. So walk me through that process. Well, we, 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 I went through that process. I, I understood where they were coming from. If there's just a brick laying on the bottom of the lake, then uh, where, where the current was, those fish could hide behind it, but they were so close to the bottom, you couldn't see them. So you would sweep the bottom and get those fish to come up after a drop shot and you could see them or whatever bait you were using and then you mark them and then you could catch them. Right, I think the mentality you should have with it is it's a different strategy. Um, I got to see your forward facing sonar system when we were on like Wiley and there were just all of these perch and you could, you could just see them but then once they hit a certain depth, it just goes away. So for somebody who's completely new, that kind of blew my mind that I thought it just scanned the whole thing. I didn't know they could disappear and be sitting right up underneath you like that. Well, the reason that happened, let me explain that to you. The reason that happened is I had my uh, forward facing sonar set. My, I used Mega Live from Hummerbird and the way I had it set, uh, I had it uh, 40 feet out and 20 feet down. Well, when those perch would go below 20 feet because I had my settings on my bottom depth at 20 feet, uh, that's why they went away. If I'd have had my bottom depth set at 30, they would not have disappeared like that. So that was my operator doing. Operator error. That's you operator error. Out. That's very well said. And so that, mm -hmm. that, but I was trying to exaggerate them and get them as big because I wanted to watch them bite the bait. So the more I could bring that in and zoom that in and the shallower and the, and the shorter the distance, the more exaggerated my bait so I could get to watch them eat it. Right, it, it's, it's really cool. It is um, cool. I was watching them. Um, now mind you, I am far from a professional fisherman. You saw me cast, casting about 40 feet out and then I had to reel it back in. But as soon as my bait would come up and it would pick it up on the, uh, on the screen, you could watch them go and attack it. That was just the coolest thing to me. That is, it's so different and people, uh, I, everybody's got different opinions on forward facing sonar and mega live and, and so uh, I enjoy it. There, there's other, uh, other topics and other reasons to have concern. We'll talk about that later at a different time. I don't want to go there. Uh, today we seem like we, we end up on that topic a lot uh, as of late and uh, I want to talk about organizing your thoughts to be, uh, not to be overwhelmed with all the information, but use the information. So now I'm, I'm, I'm searching uh, for information on fishing and I go to YouTube and, and this is what the caption says. It says, this study changes everything we know about bass fishing. Uh, that is a gigantic statement. This study changes everything we know about bass fishing. So naturally, that is the hook. That's gonna get you to watch this video. Well, this video is incredible. It is absolutely incredible. It talks about uh, Toledo Bend Reservoir in uh, 2015 and 2016. It was voted by bass uh, the number one fishery location for bass fishing in America two years in a row. No, no lake that I know of has ever received that uh, prestigious honor of saying this is the number one bass fishing destination in all of, of America. And so that, that was pretty incredible, 15 and 16. So in 2019, uh, fishing started to decline. It, it was off considerably. It, it went down 30 to 50%. So with that being done, they decided let's figure out what is going on and let's do a comprehensive study and figure out what is happening on Toledo Bend. Right. Now there was speculation, it was uh, fish and pressure and they had had a flood in 2016 or well, 17. They, they flooded it, they let the um, floodgates out and it killed a lot of the vegetation in the, um, in the lake and that's what they speculate could have happened to the, to the bass population. Um, between that and overfishing, they, one of the biggest things that they had said, um, because it was such a popular spot to fish, they were seeing a high influx of fishermen visiting the spot. So they didn't know if it was overfishing or if it was the plant life that got destroyed with the flooding or really what happened to that. So. Well, with that being said, there was speculation that 
as Sarah Beth said, it could have been overfishing. It could have been because of all the flooding, the aquatic vegetation died. And, and that would be a conclusion that I'm quick to jump on. I, I would have said that immediately. I'm big on aquatic vegetation. I think it's magic for our fisheries. And so I would have been that guy that said, well, it's easy to explain why Toledo Bend is off. It's because all the aquatic vegetation uh, that we lost or they lost uh, in the in the flood. So right. with all that being done, Ken Smith, uh, who does these videos, uh, got with Todd, what's his name? Todd Driscoll. Driscoll. Yes. And he is with the uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife. Yes, Texas Game and Fish. Texas Game and Fish. So they wanted to go in and do a comprehensive study that was a real fact-finding study. So they go out and you can watch this uh, video. Or now are you going to give them a link where they yes. can go and watch this video? Yes, if, I'll put that in the description. It's, it's a YouTube link. Okay, so we're going to take care of that where you'll be able to go watch it if you want to. But I, I'm going I'm to walk you through it. And, and in using this, I'm going to try to organize and, and show how important it is to to be able to have somebody that you can relate to, that you have confidence in, to help you sort out all this stuff. Let, let me tell you, I don't care who you are, where you come from, if you've got a job, you can't be fishing six days a week. You can't be on the water all the time. You can't be there because you got a job. Well, there's people that their job is fishing. And if they're, if, if they're reliable and you trust them, then they can be a big help to keep you organized where all this information doesn't overwhelm you. And you think I could talk maybe without using my hands? Probably just a little bit. I think, I think you just get a little passionate. <laughs> Call that speaking with passion. Yeah, I like that. I, 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 with passion. I got I, I, I got to use my hands to be able to, to talk. But anyway, uh, Get somebody you have some confidence in, hey, maybe myself. I try to be a good steward. I try to be honest. I try to be fair. I try to evaluate things based on experience and uh, information and combine the two to come up with uh, the, the truth and, and what is real and what is uh, speculation or maybe not so real. Uh, but anyway, here's what these guys did. They went out on uh, Toledo Bend and it's well over 100,000 surface acres. So it, it's obviously too big to put transmitters in bass from one end of Toledo Bend to the other. So they picked a very popular fishing spot that pretty much depicts uh, 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 Toledo Bend as a whole. They picked Housen Bay. So they went into Housen Bay and they caught with a hook, they, they caught like 16 deep water bass, 20 to 30 feet deep. And then they went up shallow and they were with a shock boat, they got another 16 bass. Uh, so they got bass that preferred deep water and bass that preferred shallow water and they put radio transmitters in them. Mm -hmm. uh, the first time it didn't go very well, they lost the fish. So they went back in uh, 2000, uh, uh, 20, 2020, and uh, they started their test in May of 2020, and they did this thing for two years. So it wasn't just something that they did for 90 days. And when it was all said and done, they lost uh, seven of the 26 fish died within uh, a year's time. Uh, what reason, I'm not sure of, but the point is they were down to 19 fish that had transmitters in them. So they started monitoring these fish. Some of them were three pound, they had a five pounder, they had an eight and a half pounder, and, and they monitored these fish and their behavior. And one thing that they concluded is fish don't move near as far as we think they do. Right. Uh, on average, uh, 150 feet a day. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't think that that is accurate for a lot of lakes, maybe Housing Bay, maybe Toledo Bend, for whatever reason, maybe they have everything they need and they don't have to move like they do on Lake Murray or Lake Wiley or some of the lakes that I've grown up fishing. Uh, right. uh, so they, they, they mm -hmm. say fish don't move nearly as much as we think they move. One thing that he did say, the fish that had the transmitters put in them, they did something a little bit odd and they moved to featureless flats 
whereas you would expect a bass to be somewhere that has more rocks, more coverage, you know, under a limb. More contour. Or something like that, too. Yeah. 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 I saw a comment underneath there that said, I would move to featureless flats, too, if I was abducted by aliens and had <laughs> surgery. <laughs> she reads all the comments that everybody makes after watching this. But uh, so we go back and this study changes everything. So now they've determined that these fish don't uh, move as far as we think they move. That's very interesting to me. I'm not, uh, I'm not disputing anything that took place in this test. And I learned a lot from watching this study. And I, I think they did an awesome, awesome job. I don't agree with everything. Uh, I, I, I don't agree that uh, uh, they say that fish only move 150 feet a day on average. I don't think that that's true and holds true for all lakes. I think you could easily say that these 19 bass that had these transmitters in them on average didn't move more than, uh, than 150 feet a day. Let me uh, ask you a question. All right. Do you think this study would have been better if they had a larger population, like a larger sample size, and um, did some different bodies of water as well instead of just that one lake? I do think it would be, but I think that that would be an undertaking that is far greater than anybody could afford. Yeah, I When you, you start people. looking at going to multiple lakes, man, they surgically, they, they shock these fish up and shallow water and they caught these fish with a hook in deep water and then they surgically implanted a transmitter uh, that they could follow them 24-7. Uh, so it was quite an undertaking and, and I want to give a shout out to uh, uh, Texas Wildlife and, and uh, Texas uh, Fish and Game and uh, th they do an awesome job. I, I love Texas. I, I, I love their, their hunting and their fishing and I think they do as good a job as any state and better than most states on, uh, on stocking their lakes, maintaining their lakes, collecting data, and, uh, and working with the, with the hunting and fishing population. So Texas is awesome about trying to solve problems, uh, keep up their, uh, their habitat for for wildlife and fisheries. So uh, I think for any other state to do what they have done is a big undertaking for anybody. But Texas, it doesn't surprise me that they went to this much trouble and this much expense because right. this was a two year project. Man, they put these transmitters, I don't have a clue what they cost, but I know they're extremely expensive. They went out on the lake and they collected this data. They put uh, 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 Todd Driscoll, Yep, Todd Driscoll. They put his phone number on the tags where if a fisherman were to catch one, he could call and report it. And, and they had one fish that had left Housen Bay altogether and would have never known where that fish was had an angler not caught it and called in that number. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty fascinating, but I want to cut through it and I want to make it as quickly as I can. You get all this information, you get all these, this speculation, and now all of a sudden you see a study such as this that is the real deal, man. It, it's telling you all, all about uh, uh, what this study showed. But one thing that was said in there is these fish do not migrate based on seasonal pattern. Their behavior did not at all reflect what we have known about fishing for many years, that fish move to the back of the coves in the, in the fall and feed on the bait. They move up in the spawning flats in the spring of the year and they spawn. They move out on the summertime ledges uh, and get more current and get off on the deeper break lines. And, and, and they stayed point blank that's simply not true. Well, that's wrong. It is definitely true. Fish definitely have season pattern. This may not have played out in this study, and I'm not sure that he meant to say this as a matter of fact as it was stated. He said, fish having seasonal patterns and travel from one place to another based on the season is simply not true. I don't think he meant that. I think he meant in this study that did not pan out. With these particular 19 bass on Housen Bay and Toledo Bend, that did not pan out. But if you're watching this and you say, okay, I saw a study and it absolutely defied seasonal patterns. Therefore, I'm never going to go fish in the back of a cove in the fall thinking fish are chasing bait in the back of a cove. I'm not going to go look for spawning flats in the spring. I'm not going to go out on the ledges in the month of May and June when the spawn is over and look for fish to be ganged up on point. 
that if you do that based on this study that says they do not follow seasonal patterns, you have missed a big part of fishing because those seasonal patterns are real and true and I've caught hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of bass based on fishing seasonal patterns. So uh, that, that was an overstatement, but he may have stated that in a different context than which I picked up on. So I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt. But the, the study was incredible. And one thing that they showed is one, a lot of fishermen, and I've been saying this for years and years and years, and I've seen it and I've, over and over again, a lot of fishermen to be able to find exactly where the fish are located, they want to take their big motor and they want to idle over the area. Mm -hmm. And then once they mark the fish, then they want to come back, cut their motor off, drop their troll motor and get in position mm -hmm. and fish the area that they just marked to locate those bass. And I've said for years, that is a bad deal. Yeah. The fish know you're there. This has been going on year after year after year after year. Fish don't have a mind or reason, but they got a tremendous instinct and you keep repetitively doing something and then you snatching them in the jaw, they catch on. And I, I've said for years, please, if I'm fishing with you, please don't idle over that spot. I know right where it is. Right. Let's fish it. And now we've got Lake Master maps. Lake Master maps are incredible. They show the contour line and I mark everything from zero uh, to 10 feet deep in red. Right. Everything from 10 to 20 feet deep in blue. Everything from 20 to 30 feet in green. And it shows a color variation as it, as it graduates down to that. So I watch the contour. Okay. So I know right where the sweet spot is. I know right where those fish should be. Mm -hmm. So I don't idle over them. And I don't, uh, I, I stay back. When I, when I get within about 200 feet, I turn my motor off, I put my troll motor down, and I think a quiet troll motor is a big deal. And you, you, you may have a preference, but I'm gonna tell you, I ran Minn Kota trolling motors, and I started doing this in, uh, in 1969 or 79 when it was not popular. I changed. I started flipping. I started learning about the flip, flipping technique. And I noticed that the troll motor that I was using had a very high pitch. And when I would hit that button, I would watch the fish spook. So I, I decided I needed to get a troll motor that didn't have such a high pitch. Well, Minn Kota was the quietest, didn't have that high pitch. And I realized it didn't take me long. I'd be fishing those button bushes and flipping. I didn't see those fish spook anymore. Yeah. So I became a big believer, and of course, Minn Kota's big um, uh, ad campaign back in those years is quiet power catches fish. Quiet power catches fish. So be quiet. Don't use that high pitch. Don't spook those fish. So now this study showed that 42% uh, of the fish in this particular study on Housing Bay and Toledo Bend, when you would idle over them with your big motor, would leave. They would not stay on that structure. They, I don't know where they went, but they would leave. Uh, that verifies what I've been saying for years. Man, don't idle over top of where you're gonna fish. Use that map, pinpoint it. If you're gonna look for fish, then look for them with your forward facing sonar. Uh, uh, but don't go in there idling, and if you got a high pitched troll motor, you're in trouble because they hear that, there's no doubt. Now there's a lot of people saying that pinging fish, you know those electronics that you put off, they ping, ping, they're a sonar, ping, they're sending signals. So a lot of people feel like they spook fish. I have not seen that verified, but I don't doubt that at all. So maybe staying back. Uh, I fish with a friend of mine in New York and he makes me, if we go in a certain bay, he makes me turn all electronics off. Turn them off. I'm telling you it spooks fish. Hmm. I've not seen them. I've gone in there when he was not with me and I caught just as many fish. So. Uh, I don't know, uh, that's speculation, but from what I see, it hasn't had that big of an effect on fish, but running over those fish do. So here we are rambling on about this study. Uh, we're, we're talking about all the, the, the overwhelming uh, studies and information that's out there. Where are we trying to go with this? What, what, what point are we trying to make? 
Here's what I'm trying to make. There's so much information, there's so many studies, and if you take everything that is out there for fact, it's kind of like the medical field. They'll say one year you should not drink coffee, it's bad for you. Two years later they say, well, we just did a new comprehensive study and we find that coffee is actually good for you. Who knows what all these things lead to? So there's got to be some method of knowing on your own or trusting somebody that does know that's out there on the water that can give you information to help you sort it all out where you're not overwhelmed and you're not changing with every study that's done. I mean, this, the, the caption of this study, and I realize they're trying to get a hook going for YouTube. The, this study changes everything we know about bass fishing. Boy, every time a study comes out, you're going you're gonna to be thinking something different. So I'm not criticizing this because I loved it and I learned from it and I picked up information. But I'm going to tell you, when you eat fish, you need to learn how to spit the bones out because you're going to get choked if you don't. So same thing. When you see all these studies and you see all these uh, uh, speculative uh, uh, reports on on techniques and methods and it, it defies what you know, be careful because there's a lot of fiction out there that's been stated as a fact. And, uh, and it, it's just a lot of information that can be overwhelming. So now, here's where I go. I go to the high schools and I tell these kids, and when I fish with these kids, the same story, I would much prefer you as an angler to understand a plastic worm. A plastic worm is, is probably the most single versatile bait. It probably catches more fish than any other particular bait. I would rather you would learn how to use that plastic worm and learn well and understand that bait rather than be pretty good with 400 different baits that you have in your tackle box. Get down to the fundamentals and build a foundation on understanding one bait at a time. Learn on your own. Uh, I talked to Bobby Murray a couple uh, uh, podcasts ago and we were talking about his uh, 1978 classic win. And he was talking about he had a big bow in his line and uh, he was catching fish on a spoon, but because of that wind blowing so hard, that he couldn't control the bow in the line and was missing a lot of fish, so he put a, took a snag of a sally apart and put a spinner on it to keep the line tight. It served a purpose. So that's the kind of things that you need to recognize when you're choosing a lure. Choose that lure to do a job like a tool and, and perfect it and understand it. And he could have never done that had he not understood it. I'm going to be honest with you, I was in that same classic. I had the same problem he was, he had, but I wasn't smart enough to figure that out. He won that tournament and he was smarter than I was because I, I, I no telling how many fish I missed for that reason. We had to make long casts. It seemed like the fish would not hit close up. So you made long casts with the wind blowing. You had a bow in your line. I did not figure that out. Bobby did. He won the tournament. So those are the kinds of things that I want you to be thinking about, about a fishing lure. Uh, not necessarily somebody's opinion that uh, uh, this don't work because of this reason. This don't work because of this reason. Uh, it's very obvious in parts of the country, if you go uh, in the spring of the year, fish move into these flats to spawn. You can see beds everywhere. If you're there at the right time, you can see the fish on them. So to say that doesn't happen is wrong. Uh, in the fall of the year, if you go to Lake Wiley where I grew up, the shad tend to, uh, the plankton move back in the back of the coves, the shad fall them back in and the fish follow the shad and they're feeding. Uh, Lake Murray, we just got through with, uh, or it's still going on actually, but we're at the tail end of the herring bite. When these fish come off the bed, the, the blueback herring, which is a bait fish in Lake Murray, they start to spawn. Those fish follow them. They, man, they school on them. And you can be on one point and there'll be dead nothing and 15 minutes later, it'll be alive with fish because they moved in feeding on those shad. 
to, uh, or those blueback heron. To say that doesn't happen is wrong. I mean, and anybody that fishes Lake Murray with any regularity, they'll tell you that's a common thing. Uh, in, in the month of May, when the spawn is over, the herons start to spawn, the largemouth start schooling, and they'll gang up on these points. If you fish Murray in the summertime at the Forest Wood Open a couple of years ago, I was down there and I was interviewing all these different anglers, and uh, they're talking about the wolf packs of bass. And I said, explain wolf pack to me. Well, there'd be 40 bass traveling together, and they're just cruising in a school, going up and down the bank looking for for bait fish. So that takes place when the thermocline moves up in the late summer and early fall, midsummer, early fall. So to say that doesn't happen is wrong. And it may not have happened on those particular 17 bass that they had tagged and in Housing Bay on Toledo Bend, but it does happen right. in different places around the country. And so if you discard that, if you, if you take that as fact, and now you based your method of fishing on the fact that fish do not have seasonal patterns, to me, you've missed half or more the, uh, of productive fishing. Right, I mean, at the end of the day, you, the fish doesn't change that much. I mean, at, you look at most creatures, they all have a seasonal pattern as to how they go about living their life, you know, and that adapts, you know. Same thing with what you were talking about with sonar or things spooking the fish, they're going to learn that and they're going to adapt to it eventually. You know, whether it takes a year, whether it takes several years, whether it takes 20 years, you know, they're going to adapt to that for their own survival. Well, you know, when the lunker lure uh, first came out about, um, I don't know, 70s, sometime in the 70s, mm -hmm. and when the lunker lure came out, uh, Guy Aker had gone up to Wren Lake, and uh, Guy's a good friend of mine, and he brought one back, and, and he gave me one. And uh, man, I thought, it's gonna wipe out fishing, because uh, you go to a farm pond, you catch every fish in a farm pond. Yeah. I mean, it blew my mind. I mean, you, they just went nuts over that thing. And uh, so I, I caught, man, I thought, man, it's not even a contest anymore. You just go throw that lunker lure in a farm pond, and every fish in there, you catch them all. <laughs> But then I learned, you go back the next trip, maybe you caught 50. You caught 50 out of a small farm pond on, on Monday. Mm -hmm. and you go back the following Monday, one week later, and you might catch 15. Right. Then you go back the next Monday, uh, two weeks later, and you might catch four. Right. I mean, and it didn't take long. You catch one or two on a lunch and they, they learn. <laughs> Don't bite that one. Yeah, they, they, he got me last time, you're not going to get me again. So fish do adapt to pressure and they do adapt to lures. And that's why it's so important to be able to change. That's why you've got you to learn new techniques, new methods, new, new ideas, new lures, because fish wise up. Fish get accustomed to a certain bait, you come out with a new bait. That's why all these changes are necessary and you can't stay where you were. People say, well, I guarantee you, Hank Parker, you were one of the best fishermen that ever fished on the tournament circuit. You could go back today with your old techniques and you could be just as competitive as you were when you retired. And that's not at all true. I, I know better than that. Uh, man, there are so many new techniques that are necessary to be able to compete. When I go fish for fun, I don't right. catch them like I used to. Man, I've adapted. I'm, I'm throwing a drop shot. Mm -hmm. I'm using forward facing sonar. I'm, I'm doing a lot of things that I had not done before to catch fish. They're way more difficult to catch today uh, than they were 25, 30 years ago. Right. So you've got to adapt and you've got to change and you've got to mm -hmm. stay with the times because the fish are. The fish are changing, they do. I remember a time when I first learned how to fish a spinnerbait, you go to Lake Wiley, pull up on a point, and just throw a spinnerbait and keep it in sight, and man, fish would come up out of 12, 15 foot of water and just hammer that thing. You go do that now, you can do it all day long, won't get a bite. And, but I mean, you used to catch 40 or 50. Right, I mean, and that's where innovation comes in too, and I think that could be the biggest argument, because I see so many comments of people, well, I still, I just still use my worm that I used in the 70s and it still works for me. I'm like, that might still work for you. But 
they are adapting. They are wanting something new, something that's going to catch the eye of the fish that you're trying to catch. Well, so. there's a better mousetrap. There, there right. always is. And, and that's why all this information is so necessary. If it wasn't, I would write you a, 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 a list, a lure list, and tell you exactly what will work. If I could go back when I fished 275 days a year, and I, I fished all these different bodies of water, and I could narrow it down to this, 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 I could just write you a little uh, uh, menu for how to yeah. go out and catch fish. Unfortunately, it has changed, and I can go back with, and take my own menu, and, and I don't catch them. Mm. I don't catch them. Uh, so you have to adapt. Now, I will say we have overlooked some techniques that uh, are still very effective. I agree. And we, we've, we've maybe put some in the back of the tackle box that we shouldn't have. Mm -hmm. Lures are tools to do a job. And once you get grounded on that, that's the way you make your adaption. So you take all these studies, which you, this, this study was a wonderful study done by uh, Ken Smith and uh, Todd Dis Deal. Oh, Driscoll. 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 With, <laughs> Driscoll. I'm terrible with that, but that's okay. <laughs> Thank you, Todd. I'm sorry I butchered your name, but you did a great job. All this information is really important, but you've got to digest it and keep it in perspective. You've got to realize it was 19 fish on Housing Bay. You cannot draw an absolute conclusion to cover all the lakes in the country and all the fish that are even in Toledo Bend. It, it is not comprehensive enough. It's not enough fish. It's not enough data to be able to make a statement like seasonal patterns just simply don't exist. You can't make those statements. You got to yeah, and you can't let that influence the way you think. So you've got to be open-minded and you've got to be able to adapt and you've got to be able to understand these new lures. What if we would have never picked up on the flipping technique? I mean, that was completely foreign to me. When D. Thomas came and started fishing on the bass circuit and he's got a, a seven and a half, eight foot rod and he's getting 10 feet from the bushes, 10 feet. That'll spook every fish in the lake. I remember watching David Glebe uh, on Lake Okeechobee, uh, I think it was 1977, mm -hmm. could have been 76, and it's possible it was, a, yeah, it was 76. It was 76. I watched David Glebe down there pull up on these peppergrass beds, and he had these big old long rods. He was from California. When I met him, I knew he was from California because I met him in the middle of the night and he had sunglasses on. So. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but I'm watching Glebe up on top of these grass beds, and I'm thinking, bless his heart. He don't know to stay back off of these fish. He's going to have them all spooked out. Bless his heart, he won't catch nothing. Well, he ended up winning that tournament with 95 pounds and 12 ounces and blew everybody's mind. And uh, he, he was pulling up there, dropping a jig, using a technique called flipping. And that's what D. Thomas had come over and won on Bull Shoals, that same technique called flipping. Uh, didn't know anything about it. And so as we learned about it, it makes perfect sense. And I took that information and I adapted it to what I like to do. The, the, there's a way to catch a fish that we all learn. It's what my dad taught me. It's what most lure designers tried to do. They tried to make a lure that you could run it in the water and you made it look so lifelike and so appealing you entice that fish into biting that bait. Right. And that was a, a method of madness. Well, here come these flipping guys along, and they came up with the technique of dropping that bait right on the nose, and they were basically uh, issuing an ultimatum to those fish. Right. And a fish like a snake. You know, you got a rattlesnake down there, and he might not want to bite you, but if you stick your leg right in his face, he's going to bite you. He's going <laughs> to react. Right. A fish is the same way. So the, the flipping guys learn to get fish to react to a bait out of impulse. Instead of enticing them, they were dropping that bait right in the thick part of where they were, dropping it right on their nose. So those fish, much like a rattlesnake, you step on their head, they're going to bite. And that's their only defense method. So they learn that you can catch fish under adverse condition by getting them to react to a bait out of impulse. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now I'm putting that together and I'm thinking, hmm, if that works, 
then maybe I can fish my big heavy spinnerbait, and that's when I came up with a three quarter ounce over a half ounce. I can fish that big spinnerbait and I can run it up there and drop it on her nose and I can get them to react to the bait out of impulse just like they can flip it. Right. So it changed everything for me. And so that's how I learned to be able to keep things in perspective. You don't have to do everything the same way everybody else does it, but you've got to understand what a fishing lure is all about. And you can't let every study and every tournament result and everybody's speculation change and overwhelm you and get you to abandon what you know works and pick up all this new technology. Right. And again, that's where forward facing sonar is causing quite an uproar because you throw everything away you learn and now you just do this new technique. Yeah. And so it intimidates old guys like me that are so, so much history and such a, a, a strong foundation that's built uh, on old mythology, old techniques. So. There's a lot to be said about where we are in this day of communication. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. Everybody's a critic. Everybody's got a handheld device. They can pick it up. They can read about what Ricky Klum won the 77 Classic on, what I won the 79 Classic on, what Bo Dowden won the 80 Classic on, what Kevin Van Dam won all his Classics on. You can read every bit of that. Mm -hmm. And you can read every tournament in between and you can read everybody's techniques and everybody's methods. And when you get through, you're going to be so confused. You don't know what color black is. You don't know what color white is. You don't know what yeah. color charger. You don't have a clue about anything because you are so overwhelmed with information. I remember the first superstar tournament may have been the second one. I think it was the first one. And Jay Yellis and I were in the same creek. And Jay is such an honorable fisherman. We had an invisible line and he would turn around and go back and I would come to that same invisible line. I didn't get in his water, he didn't get in my water, but we're fishing the same creek. Mm -hmm. He finished in the top five, I finished second. Uh, I think Denny Breyer won the tournament. I lost by one ounce. Uh, but Jay said, I'm gonna tell you, I went in that creek and I found those fish and I learned after a trial and error that you absolutely could not catch them on the big bait like I was throwing. I was throwing a half ounce spinnerbait and I had to downsize and I finally got that spinnerbait down to a quarter ounce with small blades on it and I could get them to bite. Yeah. Well, I caught all my fish on a three quarter ounce spinnerbait with a number seven Indiana blade. And Jay's saying, that blows my mind. That <laughs> defies everything that I thought was working. It didn't make sense to him. I found that to be true over and over and over again. I would go to a different angler and, and I'm thinking in my mind, they're absolutely, and you hear people say this all the time, they wouldn't hit anything but a purple worm. I could not, I threw everything in my tackle box and the only thing they would bite is this. Worm. Yeah. yeah, this is all they'd bite. They wouldn't hit nothing. I've heard that 10,000 times. And I felt like that more times than, than I can count, but then I'd go to a tournament weigh in and find out exactly what I thought didn't work is how they caught their fish. Yeah, that's why they say like an oh <laughs> moment. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, but it happened over and over again. That's why I tell people all the time, pick out a tournament angler, somebody you trust and you like and listen to them and take their advice because I don't care who you are, where you come from, mm -hmm. it has changed. And, you can't know what they know. You can't collect that data. In the old days, the sports writers, uh, uh, before the bass fishermen had the influence in the marketplace, mm -hmm. all the lure companies, they used different sports writers. And that's who influenced the market. Well, but a sports writer that lives in, in uh, Hemp Hill, Texas, that is on Toledo Bend, cannot tell you anything about what's going on in Lake Erie. Right. So all their methods are for Toledo Bend and not. But you've got Bill Dance, and now Bill Dance is going to Florida, Bill Dance is going to New York, Bill Dance is going to Texas, Bill Dance right. is going to Tennessee, Bill Dance is going to Ohio. And now all this data, Bill knows that these sports writers in Hemp Hill, Texas don't know or this sports writer in, in Lake Erie. He don't have a clue 
what's going on in the lily pads in, uh, in, in Florida. Right. So all of a sudden, the tournament angler became the authority because they're subjected to all these different environments and they learn how to catch fish in all these different situations. Right. So now if you take that guy and he comes back and he simplifies it for you, here's my list, here's what I do, here's my method. If you believe in him and he gives you good information, follow because you can't know what he knows. You don't have enough hours in the day and you're not traveling to all the places. Right. People say, well, you're a tournament fisher. Why are you listening to him? Because I know he's leveling with me and he's giving me information I don't have. Mm -hmm. I have not been on Sturgeon Bay in 12 years. Now he's telling me what's taking place in Sturgeon Bay. I believe him because right. he went up there and did this, 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 and he finally found out this is what worked. Mm -hmm. Man, look how much time that saved me when I went to Sturgeon Bay. Right. You know, I had never fished a, a little Ned rig. I never fished a Ned rig. So I got a guy that goes up there and he fishes with a Ned rig. And he said, Hank, I'm going to tell you, when you go to Sturgeon Bay, I know you like to throw those jerk baits, but you might want to set that jerk bait down and pick up that little uh, Ned rig. Mm -hmm. Wow. What a good tip was that, man. I, I threw that jerk bait and caught me about 15. I picked up that Ned rig and caught me about 50. Oh, wow. <laughs> pretty information pretty that helped me when I got where I was going. So mm -hmm. these tournament anglers can give you good information, but you can't listen to 10 or 15. You got to pick out one or two that you have confidence in and follow them. Otherwise, you're going to be overwhelmed with mm -hmm. information and you're going you're, you're going to be so confused that you're not going to be able to be prosperous. Right. Now, I know I rambled a lot, and we talked about uh, uh, the study that took place on Toledo Bend. That thing influenced me. I liked it, and it was a lot of good data. But again, you, you, when you eat fish, you've got to be able to spit the bones out, and you've got to realize uh, the fish are wonderful, but the bones are bad. So you take the bones and you discard them, and uh, you keep what is good, and you digest what is good. So that's all that I'm trying to make a statement is all these high school fishermen are overwhelmed, but so are we adults. Mm -hmm. So are we old men. Some are, so are we middle-aged men. All fishermen right now are living in an era and a time when there is so much information it's overwhelming. So let's work together to sort it all out and keep fishing fun, keep it as simple as we can within the parameters of learning new techniques and new methodology. Keep it as simple as you can, but understand that everybody's opinion and all the studies that are being done does not override what you know to be true. So stick with the basics that you know and build on that. And you can learn if you'll take one or two guys that you have confidence in and you follow them and you can learn from them and not be so overwhelmed. Mm. Would you agree with that? I, I would 100% agree with that. I think you, it's very well said. Well, it is. It's hard for me when I go to these high school kids and I sit down and I start doing a fishing seminar and I have questions that are out of, out of range. I don't even know how to answer them. And it's obvious they're in the weeds. They're deep in the weeds. They have lost their ball in the weeds. And so trying to answer their questions, I realize they have never built a firm foundation. I mean, you can build a house on the sand, and the Bible tells us about the guy that builds a house on the sand. When the storms come, it knocks it down. And so you get out in a tournament. If you're not grounded and have confidence in what you know, and if you don't know anything, you're not going to have confidence. So you learn and you know, and you build a foundation based on what you, you, you learn on your own and then you build on that with information from people that you have confidence in that travel to different lakes, tournament anglers, and you can build on that and you can have uh, a, a, a firm foundation that keeps you from being overwhelmed. And, th and that's where we are. Hey, if I listen to everybody, I, it's overwhelming to me. Uh, you, gotta, you gotta digest the part that works for you.
Does that make sense? That absolutely makes sense. I hope it does. I'm, I'm rambling pretty bad, but I really want to make this point that uh, not only the high school anglers today are overwhelmed with information, we all are. And we all got to figure out how to sort it out. And there's some wonderful studies that are being done that can help give you information, but don't take everything as absolute truth and look at it objectively and don't abandon what you know works. Build on what you know works and take all these studies and all this information to help you become a better angler. Yeah, absolutely. And keep it fun. Yeah, that, I think that's really important, keeping the uh, fun in the sport, otherwise why are you out there doing it, you know? That's the one thing that uh, I think we, we overlook sometimes when we're being in that professional fishing zone or mode. We talk about the mechanics and the fundamentals to the point that we leave out the fun part. Right. Uh, it, it's fun to win, but it's fun to fish. And everybody that's in competition, if they don't win, they're not happy. Uh, but for me, I'm not in competition. I'm going fishing, and my intent is to have fun. So mm -hmm. for the guys that are fishing in the tournament and they got to win to make a check, to make a living, y'all can go out there and be stressed out like I used to be and, and worry about uh, always being first and never being second, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, you can be stressed out. But for all of the rest of us that want to go fish, let's don't forget the fun part. Let's keep it fun and have a great time. And that's, uh, that's what it takes to... Uh, to, you know, you got to sort all this out. You got to get it all sorted out where you're not overwhelmed in order to uh, have that peace of mind that you're, you're following a, a method and technique that works and you build your confidence and you go out and you do your best and you have fun. That's all I'm trying to do is establish a baseline to, to not be overwhelmed. That is very well said, and that link to that video will be in the description as well as the link to Huckleberry Apparel and their high school fishing form as well. Huckleberry Apparel, I got it on the other side. Huckleberry Apparel, <laughs> that's something we need to uh, support to get our high school guys out there, get them funded, and give them enough, uh, enough funds to be able to uh, relax and compete and get to go on the water. So. Uh, uh, check that out, and uh, we do appreciate it. Sarah Beth, uh, tell everybody goodbye. And, uh, goodbye. Th see you guys next week. Thanks for being with us, and Thanks I'll say God us. bless you. I'll see you next time. I'm Hank Parker. House needs painting. Grass needs mowing. Where's he at? Hi, this is Hank. Sorry I missed your call. Leave me your name and your number, and I'll get back to you. He's gone fishing. <laughs>